this is all full of technical information, which we don't have to be concerned with now. But I just want to come back to this original question, what about this choice of magic or medicine? What we learn now from this information that we've now put all together, we, when we realize that all of these texts are now attributed to the same scholar, is that the issue of magic, magic and medicine is not a question of who does what. It's not the question whether the magician knows medicine or whether the doctor knows magic or uses magic. It's a question of disciplines, that there are three separate disciplines within the realm of healing arts. Heilkunde, as you'd say in German. So the one first is that you have died a kind of, this is the, the, the literary form of divination, which is applied to magic in the form, if a man suffers from such and such and such and such. So this is prognosis and diagnosis, he'll live, he'll die. So this is one kind of genre, one kind of discipline. These are the healing incantations. So these are magical incantations and rituals that can be applied in the, to, against uh, disease. It's a separate discipline with some overlap. And these are recipes. Medical recipes with drugs, potions, some kind, some kind of very rudimentary skin surgery, etc. And of course, there's overlap there's overlap in the sense that there is sometimes there are incantations here and sometimes there are rituals here that look uh, rather medical. But the overlap doesn't matter. Galen also admitted to saying that sometimes an amulet will work, but he's certainly he's a Galen is a physician, he's not a magician, there's no question. So the, the, the overlap doesn't change the general picture. These are predominant categories of, of texts dealing with three genres of healing and three disciplines of healing, but all edited or attributed to uh, the same scholar. And this gives us a much clearer picture of what we're dealing with. And this is the kind of information we are trying to tease out of this Talmudic material by analogy. What of the Talmudic material deals with, with, with symptoms, with prognosis, with diagnosis? What of the Talmudic material deals with magical uh, approaches, uh, magical incantations, charms, cameo, etc., and what material deals with drugs and recipes and uh, everything that we would, would call medical. And once we can establish these guidelines, then we'll, we'll see much, much clearer patterns between the material as a whole. So this is, uh, this is just the kind of uh, the first results that we've been achieving. I just want to mention one other final thing just before I stop, and that is, um, Shama mentioned the wonderful work of Jakob Elman and uh, Shai Sekund, of course, and all of this uh, important material on the Sasanian reading of, of the Bhavli, which has now become very popular. But uh, it mustn't, we mustn't think of the Sasanian influence and at the same time discounting this enormous substructure um, of Babylonian science which existed in Babylon. In the, in the early Amoraic period, and really formed, and, and was still alive, and still being read, and still being consulted. This was the science of its day. And this was the science which was really very influential, in, in, in my view, in the, in, in the Bible, in these technical subjects. Astronomy, astrology, divination, magic, medicine, and mathematics. So these, this, we, we mustn't, uh, be so influenced by this, uh, this new enthusiasm about the Sasanian reading of the Torah that we forget this important uh, Babylonian material. So I'm hoping that through the Babylonian project we'll be able to uh, balance out uh, the discourse on science of the Torah. Okay. Thank you very much. Terminology that the lectures have to be done in such a legal opening remarks. The first lecture, Professor Gideon Bob of the University, so well known to us for his very good numerous valuable research 
on the many different fields of uh, the, the peace discussion and civil discussions and the greco uh, Roman world, Egyptian religions, uh, antiquity uh, studies worldwide with uh, specific emphasis and have uh, 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 so much of interest in terms of uh, magic and uh, uh, magic texts and the Indonesia. Uh, some of them uh, presented in his basic uh, <coughs> monograph uh, of ancient Jewish magic, the history published uh, in 2008. Uh, Today, uh, he's going to speak about Aramaic manuals of divination from uh, late antiquity. Professor uh, uh, Geller told us a bit about uh, the overlapping or non overlapping of uh, these uh, the various genres and the uh, uh, magic and, and the medicine. Uh, who relate into what we may learn about the relation. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, okay, if it's too loud or too quiet or whatever, just tell me. And, and let me start by saying that I'm very glad to be here among old friends and hopefully some new friends. And I was uh, very glad to be invited to this uh, event because I've been following Mark's work for a long time and I've been following the development project with great interest. I come from the other side of the equation because I'm a classicist by training. So I, I sort of pull the rug in a different direction. But it's very good that there is someone pulling the rug in the Babylonian direction because I think that we had too many people with a good classical training, like show we go on another, and not enough people with a good uh, cuneiform training looking at the rabbinic material, especially at the Babylonian Talmudic material. I'm going to talk less about medicine, I'm going to talk more about divination, but we already heard that there's some overlap. And what I'm going to, to, to do is I'm going to present to you my own uh, research project that's funded by the Israel Science Foundation, and that's on, on what I called it originally is, is on science in Aramaic, and especially science in Aramaic in the Cairo Geniza. As I began working more and more, as I got the funding and it began more and more, I realized that the bulk of my work will be on, on manuals of divination, because this is the bulk of the, this is the largest quantity of fragments that I'm finding. But I'm also finding some other fragments that uh, could be classified as science, and I'm not going to go into the whole debate of whether we classify as science or not in the antiquity of the Middle Ages. And I'm also finding some medical texts, and I'll also show you a little bit of uh, medical texts. What I try to do here is to give you a very brief description of what I'm doing and what I'm hoping to achieve. And I keyed my talk to the interest of this audience in, in medicine and to Mark's interest in medicine. And you will see some examples, uh, especially towards the end, where I think that what I'm doing on divination can be done on medicine and, and where the comparison uh, might lie. Uh, let me also say that this is very much work in progress. Some of the stuff I'm showing you has been published. There's much of it has not been published. So, and, and I myself have not yet. This is my, my project is relatively new. I'm one year into the project. I've got three more years to go. So I still have a lot to learn about the things I'm going to show you. But still, I'm, I'm, um, I think they're still interesting. And, and I think that I already have enough to start painting the picture, the contours of the wider picture. I want to start with uh, one distinction which I think is important, and that is the distinction between a popular divination or what you might call do-it-yourself divination against or versus technical and professional divination. That is, when we think about divination, and I will mainly speak about omen literature, when we speak about omens, we can easily visualize people, you know, people here know that Friday the 13th is a bad day on which to go out. So, so we all have these popular omens that are well known to people, even if today some of us don't take them so seriously. 
But then there are people also in our own society whose profession is, or who get paid for uh, their, their uh, professional uh, divination and their professional interpretation of omens, of signs, of processes, etc., in order to foretell the future. As an example, that just, just you, this is a passage you all know. You know, Sifre Deuteronomy asks, what is the menachesh that is forbidden in Deuteronomy 18? And they say, who is considered a menachesh? Like someone who says, my bread fell out of my mouth, my cane fell out of my hand, the snake fell, uh, passed on my right, and a fox, on my, a fox passed on my left, a stag crossed the road in front of me, do not start with me, it is early morning, it is the first of the month, it is Saturday night. So various bad omens, good and bad omens that people know and that, um, that dictate people's behavior. And uh, rabbinic literature tells us this is all forbidden. This is also all a part of the menachesh that is prohibited by Deuteronomy 18. But are the rabbis here thinking of an individual like me who says, well, you know, my bread fell out of my hand. This is a very bad sign. You know, everyone knows that it's a bad sign, so I shouldn't do what I was planning to do. Or are they thinking about a professional diviner who has a whole list of such omens, and these are just given exactly gratia out of hundreds of omens.